and she's finishing up and she's still yelling and Caden's hiding. I grabbed her and I What's going on y'all, attorney Tom here. In today's video, I'm reacting to a video titled When a Killer Gets Manipulated into Confessing by Mind of a Criminal. Let's jump right into it. You're not under arrest. Right. You're not in custody. Right. You're free to leave. So just want to make sure we're, right. we're clear on that. <laughs> if a police officer ever tells you that you are not under arrest, you are not in custody, you are free to leave, you should leave. I, I can imagine probably getting tired of telling the story, but I would kind of like to start when you first met Michelle, okay. because I know there's a lot of history there. Right. This is Mark Castellano, currently being interrogated at the Houston Police Department for the missing case of Michelle Warner, his ex-girlfriend. Michelle, who was already a single mother, had her second child with Mark a year after they met. Just a few months after Caden was born, Mark ended the relationship. In 2012, she decided to ask Mark if he would agree to an arrangement. The arrangement involved her and Caden moving in with him, and Mark could help raise his son. They would live together, but not as a couple, just as Caden's parents. He agreed. That day, the 24th of September, Michelle never arrived at work, and her employer contacted her several times, but their calls went unanswered. That same day, Michelle's ex-husband contacted her brother, Dave Chiffon, to let him know that Michelle did not collect her daughter. David called Michelle, and when he got no answer, he called Mark. Mark informed David that on the night of Saturday, September 22nd, he had an argument with Michelle, which led to her leaving. What concerned Mark even more was the fact that Michelle didn't take her car, and most worryingly, left behind their child, Caden. Mark confessed to David that he had no knowledge of Michelle's whereabouts. Ah uh, yes, the classic fight where you leave without taking your car or your kid. Prompting the police to conduct a welfare check on Tuesday, September 25th. Unfortunately, Michelle was not found at her apartment. During the inspection, the authorities noticed the absence of hard drives from the computers, but no evidence indicated that Michelle had suffered any harm. Detectives noticed that Mark left a note for Michelle on the mirror in the bathroom, which read, Caden and I are gone. You can have the apartment all to yourself. I am taking the car. Since you can't pay it, and I now owe my dad $3,000 because of you, get it refinanced through your rich daddy and get my name off it. You are welcome to see Caden, but since you are on a drug-filled weekend, I guess you won't call since Grandma called and said you'd turned your phone off. Back in the interrogation room, Mark begins by describing Michelle in a negative way. When she gets mad, she's violent. She'll hit you, she thinks she has the right to. Um, the way she'll sit there and tell you where she's raised, you know, a man has to take up crap. She's a pretty girl and she gets everything she wants. She, she has a apprentice attitude. Wow. Is she using any kind of drugs at that time that you're aware of? Has she well, introduced that into the relationship yet? Adderall. Um, which is treating her for what? So I know this sounds like common sense, but just because somebody has a flaw, such as a drug habit, doesn't give you the excuse to commit a crime on them. And oftentimes what you see in interrogations is these interrogators are incredibly skilled at slowly building up somebody's confidence to confess. So working through the process. Yeah, she was a drug user. Yeah, she was a bad mom from that note. Yeah, X, Y, Z. And then next thing you know, this guy might be confessing to murder. Let's find out. And so hydrocodone, well, getting to know me, she said, well, you were in a car accident. You could go get some for me. It gets pretty bad uh, for a great while. Uh, the pill demand, the pill demand work. It's starting to notice that I'm changing. You know, she's having me do a lot of things, you know. Um, hey, we have an extra computer. Take one from the company. I, I need one for my brother. Or, you know, or, hey, I need you to get me something like this. I need so she's basically asking you to steal now. Yes, sir. Okay. And, of course, I do it. Okay. I did it. Well, you're invested in this relationship. Right. right? She pretty do you see what he's doing because the police officer is encouraging it? He is committing to other crimes but blaming it on her. Now, while this is important, because while these other crimes aren't necessarily the reason why they are being interrogated, 
it's that he's confessing to them and if they want to add additional charges or use those charges as leverage in case maybe the uh, murder charge isn't going too well, they can. And by the way, this is totally not the fault of the interrogator. The interrogator is just doing their job. It sounds like they're doing a pretty good job. It's just, you know, it's important that you know your rights. Let's get to last Saturday, the 22nd. Okay. As soon as I open the door, it's like a battle zone. And the first thing she says is, he gets into the sugar and dumps it everywhere. You left it somewhere, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it just goes on and on. I said something about, you, you take too many pills, you can't watch Caden or something. I said, you know, and she said, well, what are you, know, you sorry, you know? She's like, and she just walked up and she's like, by the way, you better clean it up right. And at that time she walked up to me and just hit me like that. Now, are you standing with what word? What are I'm you like doing? this, there's a desk right here. I'm on my, like this, picking up stuff. Are you in the living room? I'm in the living room, but there's those two spots on that car. Yeah, with the computer desk. By the computer desk, there's a hallway, and right there by the leg, I'm over there reaching, picking up stuff, and by that time I turn, I see her come up, and then when she comes up close to me, and I see her arms swing up from my head like that, she hits me like that. Up underneath you? Yeah, like that. It wasn't it wasn't hard or anything. I'm getting right. I'm used to it at this point. Sure. And when she walks reading. out, slams the door to her room. And about well, 10, 15 minutes later, I open the door to say, well, you know what? And Scott. Well, he's, Hayden when all this he's in his room hiding. So you think that what Michelle's been screaming at him, and that's why he goes in and yeah, reacts the way he definitely. does? Because at one time I got her. Did she cursed him? Yes. She sat there and got on his face one time, and she's on here like this. I'll get on my knees. Go ahead. And he's sitting there and shake his little hand. And she said they're grabbing him. And don't you ever, you're going to turn out to be a sorry piece of crap like your daddy, you sorry. So it's very important that even if the investigator thinks that this isn't necessarily the real story, it's important to let him talk for legal reasons because the more of a detailed story they give, the more of a likelihood that they're going to mix up these details or change these details in the future. And this is actually a problem with people who are telling the truth as well because, you know, if you, you forget the small details over time or they change in your head. So if you're very, very detailed with the police and then a year or two years or three years later when this is going to trial, uh, it, it can be seen as some form of inconsistency if you don't recall it the exact right way and that affects your credibility. But again, it's the police officer's job to get as much detail as possible. And at that point, I came over to her and but you're like that. She didn't. She caught herself. And I said, "Get up! Don't do that anymore." My heart goes out to you. What you have put up with for three years of this of your little boy's life, I very much appreciate and understand your feelings about your son. Right, right. It is about Kate. Mm -hmm. So whatever did happen in the apartment between you and Michelle, that's resulted in her now disappearing. We we'll use that word for lack of a better term. It's my impression that what that argument was about, what that confrontation was about last weekend, it wasn't about you wanting to hurt Michelle. It was about your love for Kate. Notice how the investigator is framing this. He's saying that you acted out of love for your child, not out of hatred for your girlfriend or spouse, but out of love for your child. But again, even if you are acting out of love for somebody else, it doesn't give you an excuse to uh, justify a murder. About protecting Katie. Right, because he wasn't being taken care of. Exactly. And now Mark is in protective mode for Katie. This is not happening anymore. Michelle is not going to harm my son. This is the opportunity to talk about all those things, because you've told me, you've already told me, you've laid the groundwork for what happened in that apartment, and I'm on board with you. This isn't about trying to make Mark look like a bad guy. I'm listening to your story, man, and I almost want to cry for you. I, I, I mean, I, I just can't imagine the stress and the pressure put on. This interrogator is good. 
<laughs> it's almost like he's your friend. He wants to help you. He wants you to confess because he knows what you did is the right thing. It, it, it's just, it's psychology. Because of the love you have for Caden, when you watch this woman berate him and treat him so terribly, because she's doing the same thing to you that she's doing to a three year and you're an adult. So remember, at any point in time, at any point in time, he can simply just say, lawyer. 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 I'm not talking. I want a lawyer. And asking for a lawyer cannot be used against you. So even when you feel like you're trapped in the corner, which he's doing his job and making him feel like he is trapped, that he is walking him to this path of ultimately confessing, you can break that at any time. And I'm not excusing, not excusing. I want murder. I want murderers to get caught. But it's important to know what your rights are. Michelle did not walk out of that apartment. She did not walk out of that apartment. We both know it. We both know the circumstances under which whatever did happen, happened. I'm not wanting you to explain to me that you wanted to hurt Michelle. I want you to explain to me what you felt like you had to do to protect Kate. She's getting dressed and she's finishing up and she's still yelling and Kate's hiding. I grabbed her and I broke her neck. Told me I was a sorry and that I would, she was gonna control me the rest of my life. And I grabbed her by her neck and she and, and just went through on the bed. And so she's facing you? Yeah, and I heard it pop, and then she just, her tongue up, it popped out, and that was it. Look, I'm proud of you. What? Your, your life's not over with, Mark. Show me in the room where she was. Here's the bed. Here's a closet. And here's that door going to outside. Okay. I walked in, and that's when I grabbed her, and then I threw her on the bed right there. Why are they continuing? Why do they continue to get more information? They continue to get more information because... There cannot be any avoidance of doubt. Yes, he confessed. But now let's talk about sentencing. Let's talk about how severe the crime was. Was it a first degree capital murder? Was it a sudden heat of passion? Was it self-defense? They are getting more information because they want to anticipate any future defense that he might have and be able to combat it. During Mark's sentencing phase, his lawyer argued that his case was one of sudden passion. Sudden passion can be raised as a mitigating factor during the punishment phase of the trial in Texas. It cannot be used as a defense to murder. Yeah, that's right. So sudden heat of passion isn't a, an excuse, it's a mitigating factor. But in order for there to be a sudden heat of passion, there has to be something that is just absolutely crazy the classic example of sudden heat of passion is catching your significant other in bed with another person and then instantly you you kill one of the people in the bed um that's the classic example here uh it seems like this was routine they fought often um she was changing clothes and he just walked up and uh, uh strangled her so i don't think uh i don't think sudden heat of passion would apply Let's find out. The jury did not find Mark's case was a case of sudden passion. He was sentenced to 27 years. Okay, so there you go. Um, I'm not excusing Mark's actions. In fact, I'm glad he got caught because I want murderers to get caught. However, if you are being interrogated, it is best for you, the person being interrogated, if you do not talk to the police without a lawyer. Mark should have just asked for his lawyer immediately I don't know if that meant he would have gotten off because they did have security cam footage of him going back and forth into his car and they found uh, evidence in a dumpster. But um, for the sake of argument, it at least would have uh, made it more difficult to convict him. All right. Talk to y'all later. Bye. Big verdict.